Thank you, John. Well, good morning again. How was the first session? Was it okay? okay. Uh, you know, one thing that I learned from Paul Hersey and Ken Blanchard and then my colleague Dutch Holland from the University of Houston was if the information doesn't get transferred back to the job, then you failed as the instructor. And so that's why I always include some kind of back on the job activity. And if you would, uh, be sure to take the time to fill out that leadership style questionnaire, make copies, have everybody fill it out on you, have everybody fill it out on the judge. It's a very fun and productive conversation and you can show the chart and kind of explain the concept to people and if everybody understands it doesn't say boss subordinate it says leader follower anybody can serve as the leader if they have expertise that's useful to other people on the court team uh, everybody is a recipient of direction and support from other folks and if we can all work together to help everybody learn more and more on an ongoing basis we end up being a more productive team so that that's the hope that you'll go back and do that um, did anybody have any questions they wanted to ask about this because this relates nicely to the developing high performance teams material I'm going to cover this morning. Yes, sir. Well, I, I don't know so much question, but observation of how well they do what they're supposed to do and how much they question you as the leader and how much guidance and feedback they desire. For instance, I've had many people say, gosh, I got one person on the team who always needs feedback, always needs head padding. And that person may never grow all the way to R4. And if we want them to be satisfied, we got to provide them with more feedback than somebody else who might grow to the point where they're able, willing, confident. And while they probably appreciate a well-deserved thank you once in a while, there are some people who don't need a lot of that. And so what it is is kind of observing what do they ask for and how well do they perform with decreasing amounts of direction. Also, making it comfortable for them to come to you uh, to ask for more direction or ask for more support. And they'll help you steer toward the appropriate style. Now, uh, earlier, before the session started, the, the conversation came up with a couple of the participants that sometimes one of the team members thinks of himself or herself as R4. Meanwhile, you know darn well, no way there are R4s. Their level of experience, their standards of excellence are here. Yours are here. What do you do when they think they're R4 and you ought to just leave them alone, but you know darn well they're R2s? They're willing, but they just are below average in ability. Our answer to that is, well, the two of you need to talk it over. And you need to be honest and in a, a, a respectful way, try to get people to understand the difference between where they are now and where they could be eventually, and then help them move in that direction. I'll give you a little story. I, uh, have worked for many years at the Johnson Space Center and uh, different directors come into my management classes and share their leadership secrets and a few years back there was a three-star Marine Corps general 
General Jefferson Davis Howell. I think he was from the South. Um, any rate, he came in to share his pearls of wisdom, and he told the story about how he learned to write well, and he had become a great writer. He wrote his own newsletter for the Roundup, the monthly employee newsletter. But he said he wasn't very good in terms of writing until he was an aide to some base commander somewhere in the Marine Corps. And the commander said, Beak, he had a rather large nose, his Marine nickname was Beak, I need you to write a story for the monthly newsletter on ABC. And so he goes into the other room, this was typewriter days, and he cranks it out and brings it in, sets it down, here you are, sir. Turns around to walk away and the commander said, no, 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 Beak, have a seat. Come on, let's go over this. And he takes a red pen and he reads the first sentence out loud and instead of saying A, B, G, what would you think about saying A, B, C? And Beak, of course, says, yes, sir, that sounds really good. And so he changes it. And then he goes through and changes a heck of a lot. It was a sea of red ink when this 10, 15-minute conversation was over. And the commander said, why don't you redo this, bring it back in, let's look at it again. So he brings it back in, here you are, sir, all your changes. And he turns around to walk out, and he says, no, 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 let's sit down again. And he reads the first sentence out loud, and he looks at Beak with twinkly eyes, kind of like, whoa, this sounds pretty good. And gives him positive reinforcement, makes a couple more changes, but largely left it the way it was. The third time, he handed it to him and said, go write on ABC. And he was able to do a really good newsletter. He taught him, you know, tell him what you're going to tell him, tell him all the details, tell him what you told him. You know, gave him a lot of tips that he had never gotten. Now, my point is, it's hard work to help people learn the basics in their job. But what are the costs of nobody taking the time to explain all those basics to new people who join any team, whether it's in a court or anywhere else. What's the downside? They don't build confidence. Pardon me? They make mistakes that can cause you incredible grief in your business down the road. Okay? They don't produce as much. Okay, so, you know, when you are in a situation where you have people who are R1, take the time or make sure somebody, the appropriate person, takes the time to give them the direction they need. And if we all work together to do that, then we all end up growing toward R4 faster. Okay, now not only is this a useful tool for sort of one-on-one -on -one leader, follower, interaction. The fact is teams grow and develop as well and in the booklet that I, in the envelopes there's a very famous framework uh, called the forming, storming, norming, performing model and as we very briefly look at these stages of team development Ask yourself, if you had to pick a stage that best represents your court team at this point in time, which stage would it be? The forming stage, equivalent to the R1 on the readiness scale. Initial stage marked by uncertainty, even confusion. Team members are usually highly motivated, but they're not sure about the team's purpose, structure, goals. And therefore, at that R1 forming stage, there are some high priority actions that would likely benefit the team, like clarifying the purpose of the team. What's our vision for the future? What's our mission? What are our values that we want? to guide our behavior day to day. Also clarifying the team structure and composition and hand in hand with that, the individual roles and responsibilities. Also, this is something that 
many teams choose to document, what are the expected behaviors of team members and team leaders? And by taking the time to discuss this, think this through, it clarifies standards of excellence for people, whether they're in a leadership role or not. Also, a lot of spend a fair amount of time in meetings. Think of the meetings you attend. What percentage of the time you spend in meetings wasted? Toss out a number. 80? Whoa. Anybody else? What percentage? 50? You know, and in the larger surveys, the general perception is about half is wasted. Now, what a tremendous opportunity. If half the time spent in meetings is wasted, you know, uh, there are some things we can probably do to make them much more productive by systematically planning, conducting, following up the meeting. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and asking the question, was this meeting necessary? You know, how often should we meet? And if it's just everybody kind of goes around saying what everybody else knows they're already doing, it's not a very productive meeting. At any rate, those are good things to establish early on in the team. And then the R2 storming stage, characterized by conflict and confrontation as the team strives to clarify its structure, goals, roles, and at this stage, some high priority actions would include to identify the key issues, concerns, disagreements that are surfacing and analyze the cause and effect of those issues, clarify the team's current priorities, ensure the team is moving in the appropriate direction, and formulate a team action plan to address the things that are coming up as key issues and concerns. The third stage, equivalent to R3 on the readiness scale, is called the norming stage, where team members begin to settle into patterns of cooperation and collaboration. They're evolving into a true team, characterized by high cohesion and a sense of team identity. In other words, they see themselves as a team. And at this stage, high priority actions would be taking some time to assess team progress and performance, ensuring alignment of all team members' activities toward that common team mission, identifying and addressing any unresolved issues and concerns, identifying additional opportunities to collaborate, and reaffirming, reaffirming team members' commitment to their roles and responsibilities, and finally reviewing and possibly revising your mission charter action plan if they need updating. And then the R4 stage is called the performing stage. At this stage, the team has evolved into a high performance team, highly committed to accomplishing its goals through collaborative effort and some important things to continue to do even though they're at the R4 performing stage. Take time once in a while to review progress with input from all team members and key stakeholders, the people who are impacted by the work you do in your team. Take time to recognize individual accomplishments. Identify ways for individuals and the team to improve, make continuous improvement a way of life. Periodically update the team's mission, goals, action, plan if needed. And once in a while take time to celebrate team progress and success. Now, on occasion, teams are disbanded. In the session I, one of the sessions I attended yesterday, the speaker talked about the fact that some courts are just shut down. 
they're disbanded and I work a lot at NASA and let me tell you with the shuttle program ending and the Constellation program canceled there are a whole lot of teams that either don't exist anymore or they're not going to exist within the next year or so. Uh, so adjourning wisely and systematically can be a very important thing to do. At this stage, the team disbands because its goals have been accomplished, the responsibilities have been transferred elsewhere, the team's activities are no longer needed, and when the team is no longer needed, it's important to adjourn effectively. What do we do to ensure that? Plan the orderly termination of the team, Make sure all documentation is completed, organized, accessible. Capture lessons learned. Communicate necessary information and lessons learned to appropriate people, groups, and organizations. And provide appropriate recognition for individual and team accomplishments. By the way, my observations at the Johnson Space Center have been that they've done an excellent job capturing lessons learned from the shuttle program in the hope that someday there'll be increased interest in human space exploration again and uh, maybe not have to reinvent the wheel, which, uh, by the way, was not done so well uh, at the end of the Apollo program. And uh, they, uh, you know, had to bring some of the, they call them gray beards, back in to, hey, tell us what you did, because we can't find anything written down, but it was done much better now. Well, if you had to pick one of those five that describes where your team is the most, and I understand you might be at the forming stage in certain respects and some other stage in other respects, but which one describes you the most? Which is it? And I'll just ask for a show of hands, uh, and I'll record how many people raise their hands for each. How many feel that your team is primarily at the forming stage? Forming. Okay, zero. How about the storming stage? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, okay. How about the norming stage? Okay, lots of hands here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 27 there. And how about the performing stage? Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 16. Okay. And how about the adjourning stage? Good. <laughs> Nobody there. All right. So basically that says that tend to be above average in readiness, the highly supportive, not that directive leadership styles probably appropriate a lot of the time. We had a fair number in the storming area. We're a little more selling on why we need to work together in the spirit of cooperation might be appropriate. And some in the, our four uh, performing stage, we're largely delegating to people and letting them go do their piece of the action uh, without a lot of direction or support might well be the best style to use. But at any rate, it can be very useful to go over these stages and have a conversation, where are we? And sometimes as you look at the list of actions, there's something you missed along the way, like the meeting rules. Or, I mean, I've seen court teams that have been together for a long time, but there's still some lack of clarity on roles and responsibilities where some people think they really ought to step in and help us out with X, and they don't. And, you know, having a discussion of, well, why don't you pitch in when you have the time to do it and we're all trying to do eight things at once. Uh, that can be a, a very productive conversation even if you are toward the R3, R4 
end of the spectrum. Another thing I advocate, and I know it's hard to pull off in a court environment where you sometimes have the checks being written for the team members by different departments. It's a complicated challenge, but it's, it's workable. If you could take a day to just get together and talk about how well are we functioning as a team and how could we improve, it tends to be a day well spent. You know, particularly if you haven't had that kind of team building activity in the past year or ever. Uh, how many of you have had some kind of team building activity in the past year? Okay, so it looks like about a third of you. Okay, now was that worth the time? What, what, what were the benefits you got from that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so people get out of their activity trap and all the pressures that they have at the workplace and physically move somewhere else. Yes, sir. Sure. You know, by commu communicating oh, with each other uh, okay. about the kinds of topics you typically discuss that's hopefully going to build trust, which is your keynote theme, I think, uh, Thursday. Okay. Yes, sir. their own cubicle, but uh, they're more of humans yeah. and okay. together. And yeah. so that was great uh, togetherness okay. for the whole team. So it built cohesiveness and I think the sense of team identity where if we behave together as a team from time to time, we start thinking of ourselves as a team more rather than I do A, you do B, you do C, and you know, hopefully we're all working together, but independently, why don't we work together interdependently? Now, here's some steps, and by the way, the book you're going to get has this in it in great detail, so I don't think there's any need for you to take notes, but, you know, having a conversation with the judge and getting a commitment to let's, let's do some team building around here. Uh, it's always important to do some kind of assessment of the team. Uh, a couple different ways of doing it. Sometimes I see all three used. Sometimes only one is used. You have to decide what works best for your situation. If you or some trusted individual on the team or maybe somebody from a different team that people know and respect, interview people one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, be honest with me, Harry. Is it Barry? Barry, uh, what are the key issues that you'd like to see us address to increase our team effectiveness? And I'm not going to put your name next to your comments. I mean, you do get what needs to be discussed out in the open very quickly if you do pre-meeting honest interviews, okay? Another thing is to have somebody, you or again, some other person, collect email input. Hey, we're not going to put names next to these comments, but we're going to compile them and read through the comments uh, in the session. That can generate a lot of very valuable information. The team effectiveness survey, which is going to be one of the workshop activities here this morning, provides a wealth of information on your strengths as a team, your opportunities for improvement, including uh, an open-ended question that says, okay, list your suggestions for increasing our team's effectiveness. Um, in the session itself, uh, we would discuss and analyze the assessment results. For instance, if you have a compilation of the interview comments, or the email input, read through the document and say, okay, the, what we want to crank out on this 
blackboard or this whiteboard or this flip chart are, are, would be a prioritized list of key issues that we need to address to improve as a team. And normally you got 8, 10, 12 people that were involved in the exercise, you know, be four or five pages of written comments on average, probably end up with four, five, six, seven key issues that need to be improved. Then it's always a good idea to clarify your team's missions, mission and your key results area. How many of you have taken the time in your core team to develop a mission statement? Okay, so about half of you. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't place a lot of value on a mission statement. I'm personally an advocate of it. Uh, I don't like to spend a lot of time to develop it. I think an hour ought to be max. But basically, what is it that we're being paid to come in here and do? And if we can articulate that in like 25 words or less, then everybody on the team can be briefed on it when they join the team. It could be something you can print up and put on the wall to remind people day to day. I think it's a very uh, important alignment factor for a team and worth the hour. Now, if you spend a day on it, then that may you know, probably get diminishing returns. Just knock it out, get to the point where everybody can agree, yep, I can support that mission. Also, key results areas, which by the way, as you'll see in the book, are defined as the most important things you have to do well in order to achieve your team mission. Uh, it's really good to articulate and list and print up that list of key results areas so people keep those things in mind day to day. Now, based on your discussion of interview comments, email input, questionnaire results, select some key improvement areas. Now, I am a fan of picking two or three, not five or eight. You know, you can't do eight things at once, but you can probably focus on a couple or three. So keep the list of key improvement areas short and develop a team action plan and you're provided with a form that makes it easy to list action steps, clarify who's responsible for getting it done and having a deadline uh, or milestone date for each. And then that pretty much is the end of the team building session. Unfortunately, it's sometimes the end of the process. You know, when I talk to people about, hey, how useful was your team building session, the most common complaint is, hey, we did a good job identifying problems and coming up with solutions, but then we went back to work and we had all this stuff waiting for us. And what happened to the action plan? Didn't get implemented. You know, and implementation is the whole deal. That's why we're engaging in the exercise. And conducting some action plan progress review would also be a desirable thing to do. Well. I'm going to give you an opportunity in a few minutes to assess the effectiveness of your team and you should find in the package that everyone received two copies of the team effectiveness survey. Once again, this is my questionnaire. Uh, feel free to um, make copies for everybody on your team and I strongly encourage you to get everybody to fill it out and then get together and talk about the results. But uh, the other copy is for us to fill out and discuss in here. Now it's based on 10 characteristics or common denominators of high performing teams. There's been a lot of research over the years on high performance teams and they do tend to have some common elements. Let's take a look. The first is clear direction. 
In other words, everybody on the team is clear on the team's vision for the future, its mission, its goals. Secondly, you've got the appropriate people on the team. In the general session yesterday, the reference was made to Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, where he says you want to get the right people in the right seats on the bus in order to get where you want to go. Well, that's for sure. And, you know, <clears throat> it, it, in any kind of organization, private sector, government, it ain't easy to get rid of people, right, if they don't work out. And so really being thoughtful and systematic um, and maybe collaborative as a team on who would be the best to join the team can save you a lot of problems down the road. And sometimes we need a position filled, so we just go for the first person that appears and regret it forever after. So discuss, you know, how do we make sure when new people join the team that we influence any way we can who that person is. It's important to clarify everybody's roles and responsibilities, not only for themselves, but that everybody else has a solid understanding of who is responsible for what. And of course, we need people who are committed to fulfilling their roles and responsibilities. We need effective communication internally and, in, and externally. Obviously, the people who are working there day to day need to be communicating openly honestly, with trust, etc. cetera. Um, by the same token, you deal with a whole lot of other stakeholders and making sure that we're communicating effectively with each is an important thing to do. This one, adequate resources, having enough people, enough budget, the right kind of facilities, the right equipment, the right materials, the right information. And in tough times, that's a challenge. And figuring out how can we secure additional resources that will make us more efficient and productive, how do we do more with less, that seems to be a, a challenge for an awful lot of teams these days. We want focus on quality and customer satisfaction. I think that boils down to making sure that we're assessing somehow, informally or formally, the quality and customer satisfaction we're delivering. Innovation and continuous improvement. Asking what can we do differently to be better. Making continuous improvement a way of life. Cooperation with other parts of the overall organization. Are, is your court team viewed as a team player? Do you support the activities of your stakeholders? And appropriate consequences. What that really boils down to is if an individual performs well, that person is given that feedback. They're recognized and rewarded. It might just be verbal recognition, but somehow it's rewarded. Same thing for the team as a whole. When the team performs well, somebody notices, and you recognize and celebrate your accomplishments. How many of you have had some kind of team celebration in the last year? Okay, well, that's about a third of you again. And then the last, that the team can point to positive results from its efforts as a team. Okay, to establish a little baseline data here that hopefully you'll be able to compare to your group data that you generate back on the job, I'm going to ask you to take a, one of the two copies of the team effectiveness survey and notice there are five questions or items for each of those ten categories. The first five, one through five, are related to clear direction and so on. And what you're asked to do is to read the statement and ask yourself 
how much do I agree or disagree with that statement as it relates to my court team? If you strongly disagree with the statement, please circle one. Disagrees two. If it's 50-50, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Neutral is three. If you generally agree, four. If you strongly agree, five. And it usually takes just 10 minutes or so to fill out the 50 items. Notice there is a back page, and I would ask that you list a couple or three suggestions for increasing your team's effectiveness. Let's take a total of 15 minutes and do that, and then we'll talk about the results together. Okay, does everybody have their 10 scores added? Anybody need a little more time? Okay, now remember, I'm going to go down the list, raise your hand when I get to the category that had the highest score, and if you had a tie for your highest score, you get to raise your hand more than once if it's an exact tie. <clears throat> How many of you had as your highest scoring category clear Direction, clear direction, we had one, two, three, four, five of you, okay? How about appropriate team composition was the highest? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay. That's got to make life easier for all those folks, huh? How about number three? Commitment to roles and responsibilities was the highest sum. One, two, three, four, five of you. Okay. Let's look at effective communication, highest of all. One, two, three. How about adequate resources? One. We may need you to come up here and explain how you're doing that. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> How about focus on quality and customer satisfaction is the highest? One, two, three. All right. Innovation and continuous improvement. One, two, cooperation with others. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. How about appropriate consequences? One. And positive results. One, two, three, four, five. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. All right, so what does this say in terms of strengths? Having the right people, cooperating with others, achieving positive results for the group overall seem to be the greatest strengths. Now let's do the same thing voting for the lowest scoring category. How many had as your lowest score? or if tied, one of your lowest scores, clear direction. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. How about appropriate team composition? One, just one, okay. Commitment to roles and responsibilities, the lowest. One, two, three of you, okay. 
How about effective communication? Lowest score, one, two, three. And adequate resources? Lowest score there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen of you. Okay. And focus on quality and customer satisfaction. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. All right. Innovation and continuous improvement. One, two, three, four. Cooperation with others. One, two, three. How about appropriate consequences? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And positive results. One, two, three, four. All right, so which seem to be the biggest areas of concern, resources, common complaint these days, sufficient focus on quality and customer satisfaction, making sure there's appropriate consequences, positive and possibly even negative, for the performance that the group delivers. Um, now, suggestions. Um, all of you listed a few ideas on the back, okay? And what I'm going to ask you to do is to look at the lower scoring items and the suggestions that you listed and come up with what you feel are your one or two most important key improvement areas. Areas where if your team focused some attention, you'd have the greatest payoff. Okay, and by the way, I did give you a handout that you could reproduce for your team on developing a mission statement, identifying your key results areas, and identifying your key improvement areas. So let's jump down to key improvement areas. Everybody list one or max two key improvement areas that you want your team to focus on. And then since we have a wonderful resource of lots of other people who work in different parts of the country, I've got a fun 15-minute feedback exercise, and let me explain how this works. I'm going to have you either turn to somebody next to you, behind you. If you want to stand up and go talk to somebody else in the room, that's cool. But based on your team effectiveness survey results and the suggestions you put on the back, select a key improvement area, pair up with somebody else for a max of five minutes and shorter than that is better. And just say to the other person, hey, I'd like to improve communication or whatever you want to focus on in my team and ask for their ideas. Uh, what are your suggestions for improving communication on my team? Take your pen and a sheet of paper with you jot down the ideas you get from the other person, and then switch roles where they ask you the same question and you give them some creative ideas. This always leads to things we wouldn't have thought of ourselves and gives us a chance to share some creative ideas. Try to pair up with several people, and I'm going to time you. This is 15 minutes exactly, okay? So if it's somebody next to you, great, but everybody pair up with somebody else, max of five minutes, and then move to somebody else. Okay. And if you need... Well, would anybody be willing to share what your key improvement area was and some of the ideas that you and others came up with for dealing with it? A couple examples would be nice. Yes, ma'am. Oh, wait, so I've got to get the, the microphone. microphone here. 
It's coming. So everybody can hear. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, actually, ironically, we both had scored our communication relatively low, so we focused on that, and it was... Um, the first thing we had to do was to define the team we were talking about and then what our problems were. And I think we both maybe agreed. I don't know if we agreed or not. But um, what we need to do is, is go back to the team and say, and it has to do with our effectiveness of our meetings. How often do you want these meetings? How do you want to define the meetings? What is it we expect to get out of the meetings? What roles do you take? So what you talked about earlier, but we want to get the feedback from the team members specifically so there's buy-in. So really define what we expect, what it is we need to get out of them, et cetera. So. Okay. Very good. Uh, by the way, in the book that you're going to get shortly, uh, there is a list of meeting rules that you might use as a resource for coming up with a list of rules your group wants to follow. How about somebody else, your key improvement area and an idea or two that you generated? Don't be shy. Okay, we've got one person up here. One of my uh, improvement areas was clear direction to the team. And out of that, particularly question number four about goals and objectives was, was the key over there. And we had a mission statement which was getting, um, was not being understood clearly by, by the team. And some took it in one way or another, took it another. Particularly one individual in, in our team wanted to perfect everything he or she did and would miss timelines because of the mission statement. And uh, always when asked why you're missing timeline, he would point to the mission statement. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I th you know, talking to Linda and, and from District, uh, district uh, Tony, um, I think we can improve on a mission statement okay. and uh, continuously improve that process and revise those. Thank you for sharing that. And you know, mission statements probably ought to be revisited on an annual basis because sometimes things are happening, things are changing so quickly that the mission statement and maybe key results areas ought to be changed accordingly. So, um, you know, get in the habit of spending a day a year to do the team building activities and I think you'll see a real benefit from doing it. Now, just to refresh what was in the envelope, you do have that stages of team development that you could reproduce for your team members. This team effectiveness survey, I strongly encourage you to use this as a way of identifying your strengths and celebrating the things you do well, as well as identifying areas that need improvement. If you encourage people to write out specific suggestions, you have a resource that you can use to discuss what can we do to improve as a team. Also, you've got the form that can help uh, formulate your team mission identify your key results areas, the things you have to do well in order to achieve your mission, and your key improvement areas. And the last sheet is a copy of a standard action plan form where you will put the name of the te your team and let's say key improvement area number one, and you would list what it is you're striving to improve, uh, improve communication, uh, clarify the direction of the team, whatever. And it's always good, we found, to have a champion for the action plan, and that would be somebody who's willing to take the ownership for making sure that the action plan does get implemented. So maybe that's something you could volunteer to do the first time. Uh, and then list action steps, when you're going to do them, and by whom. On the by whom, we suggest not putting the word all, right? Because when you say all, what does it almost always translate into? Nobody, okay? And even if everybody's going to be involved in the action, why don't you 
put the responsibility on one person to make sure that it indeed does get uh, accomplished. Um, I love this quote from Jack Welch, the highly successful CEO of General Electric. The world's best plan is worthless without execution. After you take time to develop an action plan, why don't you put it on an agenda for your team meeting once a month. Once a week might be a little much, but revisit it once a month, do a progress review, have the champion organize it and make sure it happens and have the people whose names were listed on the action plan report on their progress. And if you follow up, the chance that you'll really do what you know you need to do increases tremendously. Uh, I hope you find the book helpful. It really describes what we've done for a short period of time here today in a better detail and gives you lots of examples of vision sta statements, mission statements, value lists, meeting rules, etc. Uh, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful conference. If any of you weren't able to come to the uh, plenary session this morning where I passed out these white envelopes with the leadership style questionnaires in it. Uh, I think if you go to the front desk, they would be happy to give you one. Have a great conference. Thank you all. Appreciate it.